now call on Christine Graham to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I have to agree with uh, David McCletchie that power devolved is indeed power retained. We are talking about obtaining independence. And he also knows, as a divorce lawyer, as I was myself, that when one, when one party sees the end of the marriage, the marriage is at an end, the detail is then negotiated according to law and practice. The same would happen in a dissolution between two parts of a united uh, kingdom. I think it's important, however, to work back sometimes to why certain assertions are made, for example, in the claim of rights that the Scottish people are sovereign. So much slips into our everyday parlance that has a deep-rooted and substantive cultural or constitutional genesis. For example, when you hear Scots reprimanded for saying, I seen it, or I done it, this is in fact language that is grammatical, phrases that have survived through centuries of spoken Scots. They are not lazy or ignorant slang, but an echo from the past, which takes me to the claim of right in 1989 and the words we gathered as the Scottish Constitutional Convention do hereby acknowledge the sovereign right of the Scottish people to determine the form of government best suited their needs. Indeed, that Constitutional Convention was proposed in a private member's bill way back in 1980 by the SNP leader, Gordon Wilson. Now where did that sovereign right come from? There is no written UK constitution but fragments of an incomplete constitutional jigsaw, some predating the Treaty of Union. And for example, as already we mentioned, you have to go back as far back as the Declaration of, of Broth, a Declaration of Scottish Independence, and also of conditional monarchy. Yet the quote is, yet if he should give up, talking about Robert the Bruce, what he has begun, and agree to make us or our kingdom subjects, the King of England or the English, we should exert ourselves at once to drive him out as our enemy and a subverter of his own rights and ours, and make some other man who was well able to defend us as our king, for as long as but a hundred of us remain alive, never will we in any condition be brought under English rule. That is a king there by leave of those at the time representing the people, a narrow bunch at the time, some 51 magnates and nobles, but nevertheless, he was on parole. Now the significance of those words resonating through the centuries, the monarch, the power to rule was conditional on the will of the then people of Scotland. This is reflected in the fact that Queen Elizabeth is Queen of Scots, and not of Scotland. Sovereignty, therefore, now exercised in this democracy by various institutions is exercised through the express will of the Scottish people, which takes me to why Queen Elizabeth is designed as Queen of England. I think if my recollection is accurate, it was Henry VIII of the Tudor dynasty who, installing himself as head of the church, embedded the divine right of kings to rule. Sovereignty, the embodiment of which was the monarch, was absolute. As through centuries, power was removed from the crown and transferred to the English Parliament, so was sovereignty. And so the English Parliament was indeed sovereign, but that does not overrule or supersede the conflicting principle of the sovereignty of the Scottish people. The Treaty of Union, 1706 Article 3 states that the United Kingdom be represented by one and the same Parliament to be styled the Parliament of Great Britain. The significance is that it was not a continuation of the English Parliament, nor indeed the Scottish Parliament. Sovereignty, therefore, for Scotland remains as it always was, with the people. I can also pray and aid the case of McCormick against the Lord Advocate, 1953 session cases. It was the blowing up of the post boxes with E2 Arnhem because Elizabeth was the first Elizabeth of Scotland. And the following remarks made obiter in that case, and I quote, Considering that the Union legislation extinguished the parliaments of England and Scotland and replaced them by a new parliament of Great Britain, I have difficulty in seeing why it should have been supposed that the new parliament of Great Britain must inherit all the peculiar characteristics of the English parliament as if all that happened in 1707 was that the Scottish representatives were admitted to the parliament of England. That was not done. The principle of the unlimited sovereignty of Parliament is a distinctly English principle which has no counterpart in Scottish constitutional law. So why the potty constitutional history lesson? Because it's significant to the legitimacy of the referendum. It is of course not consultative. It has legal, constitutional authority as well as political authority. In 1979 and then in 1997 there was no Scottish institution to provide a mechanism for asking the Scottish people a question on the Constitution. 
In 1979, the UK government took it upon itself by drawing up a referendum and, of course, drew up the questions, chose the date, 1st of March 1979, right in the middle of the winter of discontent when snow was falling over Scotland. That in itself was an omen, but the 40% rule, which effectively counted the dead and those not exercising their franchise to vote as a no, was the real treachery compounded by Sir Alec Douglas, whom on the eve of poll broadcasting we should vote no for a better deal. Plus a change, plus a la même chose. Now we have our own mechanism in the Scottish Parliament, but we don't need to have a Parliament. Even if this didn't exist, and the Scottish people were to stream out onto the streets of our towns and cities, into our villages, on megaphone, on marches, online, and say with a clear voice, they wanted an independent Scotland again. That would be a declaration of independence and no challenge from the Palace of Westminster or the corridors of the United Nations or this place, nor any courts could gainsay it. The Scottish people would say they'd done it, and they'd done it their way. Thank you very much.